to turn into the word of the Lord here this morning to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. As you're turning there, why don't you just turn to your neighbor and say, you're looking good this morning. looking good in the house of the Lord this morning. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet. I'm just going to switch mics now. So it's not so echoey. And uh, sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Don't you care, Jesus? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, Thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. I'm just going to read it from a different translation. It says, Now as they were traveling along, he, Jesus, entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But, Mar but Martha was distracted. Everybody say distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. And if you'll allow me for... A few moments here this morning, I'm going to speak to you on the topic, the good thing. <laughs> the good thing. Amen. Amen. We're going to just pray over the rest of the service that God would have his hand upon it. Lord, we are so thankful that we are able to come into your house here today. God, we have come for one thing, one thing only, to give you praise and worship. God, to lift up your name on high. God, we pray right now that you would have your hand upon every single person that has come into the house of the Lord. God, allow this word that you have given me here this morning to work its way into each and every heart. God, I pray that you would have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. The good thing. How many has wel welcomed guests into your home? I would suspect that that would be the majority of people. And uh, how many has ever welcomed uh, someone and you realize after welcoming them that everything's a mess. Has that ever happened? Oh my goodness. You put it into overdrive and you just start rushing through the place making sure that everything's okay. You usually send them a message saying our place is a mess just to warn you. You send them something like that. So you're motoring through the house stuffing everything into drawers you know, pushing it in, stuffing it in. You're putting everything in closets. You're hiding all the dirty dishes inside the stove. You know, you're doing all these things, you know, trying to get the place looking decent on the outside and uh, rushing around with all these preparations. And uh, we had, we had uh, Brother and Sister Corliss over to our place last night, and we had warned them before coming over that our place wasn't uh, up to par. They wanted to bring us a, a housewarming gift, so they had stopped by with that, and my wife had warned them that the house is a mess. We, we had our two kids, of course, that were playing, and then we also had Ethan and Ezra, uh, Pastor and Sister Carter's grandkids that we were looking after while pastors in the hospital. So they're, they're running around, and uh, of course, as kids do, and they've got toys out everywhere. 
So my wife is like, I, I know I warned them, but I feel like I should go in the house and start cleaning. So she runs into the house and just starts, you know, picking up everything and putting it. And I'm watching her in the window as I'm watching the, the kids outside. And I'm watching her through the patio door, and she's just a mad woman, running around the house, putting everything in everywheres. And uh, brother and sister Corliss walk into the house, and they're like, this isn't bad. She's like, you should have seen it 10 minutes ago. <laughs> you know, but that happens, you know, that happens. And uh, I can just imagine what it would have been like when Jesus came over to Mary and Martha's house this day. And we have Mary who just wanted to sit at the feet of Jesus. She just wanted to sit there and listen to this master's words. And then we have Martha that's running around like a chicken with her head cut off. I don't know if you've ever heard that yep. expression or have ever seen that happen. Yep. <laughs> it's quite comical. <laughs> but she's running around like a chicken with her head cut off, trying to figure out uh, what she's going to make for, for putting out, if she's going to put out refreshments, if she's going to put out what she's going to put out for refreshments and all of this. And she's cooking and she's cleaning and she's doing all of this housework. And meanwhile, her sister is just sitting there like a bump on a log, not doing anything. It appears that way. So she comes barging out of the kitchen. Jesus, would you just tell, Mar would you just tell Mary to come and give me a hand here? Can't you see that I'm running around? And she's all flustered. She's frustrated. She's out of breath, I'm sure, trying to figure out what she's going to do. To, what do you make for Jesus? What does he eat? <laughs> you know, so trying to make everything just right. And uh, so this is where we come into the story. And this story of Mary and Martha uh, seems to always spell trouble. It, you know, you have some that say, I, you know, I think Martha was right. I, I mean, can you, you can't just ignore all the things that need to get, get done, right? You, you still have to do all of these different things. And then you have others that say, I don't think Jesus was fair, very fair to Martha at all. Do you? This uh, is such an incredible story that we have here. And there are even some who can relate with Martha, feeling as though they have been just left to do all the dirty work. And uh, I, I have to do everything around here. I might get in trouble for this, but I'll just look this way. Have, has your wife ever asked you to do something? And then you start doing it. And then it's not to the way that she would have done it. I'll give you a couple of examples. A couple of examples. <laughs> Still looking this way. So <clears throat> I make these oatmeal cookies and they... Everyone, everyone that I give them to goes nuts for them. And uh, I, I have the recipe written down, all of this. And uh, if you know my wife, the kitchen is, is her domain. So wh whatever happens in there needs to be how she would do it. And I'm, anytime I make these cookies, she stands over me saying, that's, that's not how you do it. That's not how you do it. <clears throat> and I just put my finger up and say, excuse me. <clears throat> who makes the cookies properly. <laughs> and because uh, anytime that she tries my recipe, it doesn't turn out for whatever reason. And she gets upset and she's like, you're leaving something out. I know it. You're leaving something out of the recipe on purpose. You know, and uh, it's just the way that I make them. I, I don't know how they work out. It's just the way that I make them and they turn out. But, you know, there's certain things that you get particular about in a kitchen. Especially, uh, you know, especially if... Uh, that is a place where you you know where everything is, you've stored it properly and all of that. So when someone comes into your house, then, uh, then you can get a bit flustered if, uh, if you're in a rush and you don't know what to do and you're making preparations and all of this and you look over and you see somebody that should be helping you just sitting there. And uh, my, my wife went to, I'll tell you one more story. This is good. <laughs> so... <clears throat> This is getting good. <laughs> um, I, th this was when we were first married. Uh, we, were, we were in this apartment, and we had this tiny little kitchen. 
And my wife had asked me to go and wash the dishes. So she was in a rush. I can't remember what we were in a rush for, but she was in a rush. And, and so I come over and I start cleaning the dishes. And I wasn't doing it fast enough was the problem. So my wife, who had asked me to do it, says, never mind, I'll do it, and pushes me out of the way and starts cleaning the dishes very viciously, <laughs> vigorously, so much so that she breaks a glass and cuts her hand quite, quite bad that she needed stitches, so we ended up going to the hospital. You know, but you can get into a rush. You can get into a rush whenever you have something to do and, and you've got preparations to make. And, you know, so there are some that can relate with Martha. I'm always left to do the dirty work. I always, I always am left to, to clean up. And you know what I'm talking about. You're out at the barbecue. You've got 40 pounds of hamburger to cook up. And uh, everybody else is inside, you know, talking and laughing and all of this. And you're out here sweating, swatting off flies, all of this, just trying to, just trying to deal with the barbecue. And uh, I can just imagine how it would have been for for Martha here this day. And I can assure you that if you have trouble with this story, you are not the first one. I mean, the dirty work has still got to be done, right? The work still has to be done. And Martha was doing her best to provide for all the guests, and she should be commended for it. She really should. Even Jesus is there, and he needs to be taken care of too. And she is a very good worker. Good worker bee. And I am sure that uh, she just wanted to make a, a very special event for Jesus. She wanted to make a good impression, as anyone would if you welcome someone into your home. You want to make a, a good impression. And uh, she wanted to give her, him her best. But something negative happens in this story. Rather than being a happy occasion, it turns into a bad occasion for Martha. It kind of puts a sour taste in her mouth. And uh, it is found in verse 40. Let's just take a peek at it here again. It says, but Martha was distracted with all her preparations, it says. Can this be a case where Martha is so busy serving Jesus that she is not paying attention to Jesus? Her attention has been distracted off the one thing that is most important, her house guest that day. Could we become so busy serving God that we are distracted and we just don't listen to him? Of course, the food is important. People have to eat to survive, right? I'm not the only one. The basic necessities of life, they have to be taken care of. But what if food becomes our focus? What if the task becomes the focus? What if the task becomes our primary objective? You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other, or he will be devoted to the one or des and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on, even the clothing that you put on. He says, don't worry about it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Isn't life more than the food that we eat and the clothing that we put on? Sometimes uh, we can easily think in the natural by what we see and get caught up in the tasks that are at hand. We get caught up in things that just need to get done. It's on the to-do list. It's on the honey-do list. I've got to get this done. And we get so caught up with those things that we miss out on the main point. And the main point is and was that day was the house guest that they had. He also taught in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, he said, people cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Someone has said it is better to go hungry than to go wrong. Um, often we place a value on ourselves based on how busy we are. I don't know as much if it is on the feminine side, but on the masculine side, I know that for a man, the more busy we are, then the more validated we feel with, with uh, who we are as a person. You know, the things that, oh, yes, I'm so busy. I've got this job to do, and I've got that job to do. And we almost get a bit of pride about it because we have things that require us to do them. You know, and uh, it needs our attention. 
And we are like Martha sometimes when Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you were worried and bothered about so many things. You're caught up in so many things. And perhaps the best thing we can do is stop rushing and start listening to Jesus. Stop moving and start meditating. Perhaps we need to stop worrying about so many things and focus on the thing that really matters, the thing that's really important. You see, it is very easy to get out of focus. There are several things that happens when we get our lives out of focus. At least that's what happened to Martha. The first thing is that a loss of focus causes questioning God's care. That's the first thing, first thing that happened to Martha. Look at verse 40. It says, Lord, do you not care? Don't you care, God? Can't you see that I'm just trying to do all these things for you? She was trying to do it for him, for his house guest, for the house guests that she had and trying to prepare all these meals and trying to get everything out in an orderly fashion so he wasn't waiting long and trying to get the house clean and all of this. And it was for him, right? Amen. And she gets so exasperated with everything that she's doing and coming out and seeing her sister just sitting there that she says to Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care about me that I'm rushing around like, like crazy here trying to get everything done, and yet it seems as if you don't even care. You're just sitting here entertaining somebody that's sitting there doing nothing. And she gets so frustrated about it. There seems to be an accusation in her voice. Lord, are you not paying attention to what is going on here? Lord, don't you see all the work that I'm doing? Come on, just, just do something. Don't you care about me? Martha was angry at Jesus because he continued to let the situation go on and on and on. Notice that Martha addressed, addressed her irritation at Jesus. You have to admit that she is one gusty woman. <laughs> Pinpoints Jesus as being the problem. Don't you care? Yeah. You're just sitting there not doing anything about this, and here I am doing everything. Martha is accusing Jesus of not caring for her because... She was sure that if Jesus really cared for her, he would have done something about the situation. I wonder if you have ever wondered if God cares for you. Have you ever accused him of not caring for you, not taking care of you, not watching out for you? Have you ever questioned where God is when you're going through difficult times? Why aren't you here for me? And if we're honest with ourselves, I imagine the majority of us have. You know what I'm talking about. You know that God could fix this situation if he really wanted to. He doesn't have to allow you to go through it. All this difficult work that you have to go through. And yet he seems to just sit in silence at times. God doesn't care for me. Is he just going to sit back and do nothing? But yet God's word says in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Luke chapter 12, verse uh, 6 to 7, it says, Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Here's a great truth. God always takes care of his children. There may be times in your life where you want God to speak and he doesn't. Don't judge the silence of God as being unconcerned for you. Sometimes we mistake that. God doesn't care because he's silent. That's not the fact. He knows what you're going through and he will always watch over you. Martha was worried about the biscuits, more about the biscuits than she was about the blessings. She was more concerned about her roast than she was about her relationship with Jesus. This day and lots of focus always confuses the issue. God does care for you. We, it is possible. The Bible says don't get weary in well-doing, which tells me that it is possible to get weary in well-doing. In doing good, you can get weary. And she was trying to do good. She was trying to be a good house guest. She was, she was trying to be a good... Uh, she was trying to be a good... Uh, steward of her house and take care of things and clean and do the tasks at hand but her focus was wrong number two focus loss of focus causes finding fault with others in the second part of verse 40 Martha, Martha finally explodes with anger and she comes out of the kitchen boiling mad 
She says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work alone? Tell her to help me. So she doesn't just ask her sister, pull her aside and say, look, I'm, I'm kind of busy in the kitchen right now. Can you come and give me a hand? No, she tells her house guest, can't you just tell her to come and give me a hand? Tell my sister that she needs to give me a hand in the kitchen. She doesn't even talk to her sister. She's so upset. <laughs> Instead, she, she boils out at Jesus. Martha doesn't even call her sister by name. She is mad at the world, and those who are close to her should know it. Watch out. How can Mary just leave me here to fend for myself? Can't even my sister come and help me? Can't she see what's going on? Who does she think she is just sitting there doing nothing? Have you ever been around people that when they get mad, you don't want to be anywhere in the neighborhood of they are, of wherever they are? Okay, just back out of here. Where the Lions was telling me before a service here that uh, that they had stayed at this motel on their way somewhere, so they had finally found a spot to rest, and it wasn't exactly the most ideal place. And at 2:30 in the morning, he said that they had to bolt out of there because all of a sudden there was a big commotion that went on. Everybody was screaming, all of this. So they just got up quickly went to their car and, uh, and left. But that's what happens whenever someone gets upset. You don't really want to be in the same room as them. Nope. You tend to flee, and you go into this fight or flight mode. You're either going to fight back with them or you're going to just run. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the explosion may not kill you, but the shrapnel will. <laughs> there are people that when they get mad, that they are mad at the world, and they take their frustration out on everything and everyone. Here's some wisdom from the Bible on anger. James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, it says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but, everything must be quick, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Proverbs chapter 22, it says, Do not associate with a man given to anger, or go with a hot-tempered man, or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. If you often get angry, pay attention to what you're focusing on. If your focus is on your situation rather than your savior, perhaps you need to refocus. And thirdly, loss of focus causes restoring to self-pity. Resorting to self-pity, sorry. Do you know what this all boils down to? Martha is feeling that life is not treating her fair. Life is not fair to me right now. Others have it so easy. They can just get by and relax and rest. And meanwhile, the rest of us have to do all the work. I've never heard that statement before, but I'm sure it's probably out there, right? <laughs> I'm sure that somebody at one point in time has said that statement before. And life is just not fair. We've got to work so hard to get everything that we have, and others just seem to get everything just handed to them. And uh, it's just not right that I am being treated this way. No one should have to do all the work that I am doing by themselves. No one cares about me. And this becomes the world of self-pity. <coughs> Look at verse 40 one more time. It says, but Martha was distracted with all her preparations. Go ahead and circle that word distracted. The sense of the word translated distracted here means to be pulled away or to be dragged away, in other words, to be taken captive, to be made a prisoner against one's own free will. The implication is that Martha wanted to hear Jesus herself. She wanted to be seated at his feet too. She wanted to be seated next to Mary, but she was pulled away. She was taken captive by her sense of duty. There are things that need to get done. I don't have time to sit at the feet of Jesus. There are things that need my attention. Fretting about the meal has robbed her of the joy of listening to the Lord. We should, of course, take our responsibilities seriously, but not to the point where we neglect listening to Jesus. She wanted to listen to Jesus as he offers words of abundant life. She wanted to listen to him as he said, if you want to save your life, you must give it away. She wanted to listen to him as he explained that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. She wanted to listen to him when he said, pray for your enemies and bless those who curse you. She wanted to listen to him as he said, I am the bread of life. Who, he who eats of this bread will live forever. She did want to listen to Jesus. But she could not listen to him, for her mind had been taken captive by many things. So Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. Focus on me. Here's a great truth. 
Loss of focus can be cured by refocusing on Jesus. We can be so busy with the things of life. We can become so distracted by what is going on that we miss Jesus. Mary focused on listening. Martha focused on serving. And Jesus calls Martha to refocus on a most basic principle and commends Mary for choosing to focus on the good. Jesus unmistakably declared that out of all the things in this life that one may choose to pursue, only one is truly necessary. It was Mary, not Martha, who chose the good thing. Just what did Mary choose? If we could all stand at this point, I'm going to come to a close. I could have the music come back. Some say the lesson is to sit at the feet of Jesus. The main verbal idea in the passage is not to sit at the feet of Jesus, but to hear or listen to the words of Jesus. That's what the important part is. That's the good thing. The universal principle taught by Jesus here in this passage is not so complicated. There is only one good thing necessary to pursue, not to work more, to find more things to do, not to add more programs, not to make ourselves more busy with the work of God that we don't have time for Jesus. Amen. Not to get more money and not to get more friends and not to get more popularity, not even to be more effective, but really just to listen to Jesus. The simple truth God communicates to us is to get ourselves in a position where we continually hear the words of Jesus. If you want life, if you want freedom, if you want answers to prayer, if you want growth and continual transformation, if you want stability in your life, you must take your cue from Mary who chose the good thing. Amen. Who chose the good thing. That would not be taken from her. And position yourself where you can hear the words of Jesus. Hearing and heeding the words of Jesus must become our ultimate priority. Instead of getting busy with many things, we need to be like Mary and focus on the good thing. Listen to Jesus. Listening to Jesus. I'm going to open up this altar here this morning. I just want us to come and listen to Jesus. Don't come with any sort of agenda. God, I've got this, 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 this to talk to you about. God, I just want to hear from you. I just want to listen to you. I don't have any sort of tasks at hand right now. I'm pushing everything out of my mind. That I, you know, I know that there's things that need to get done. I know that there's things that are on the to-do list right now. And even as I speak right now, they're going through your mind. After church, I've got to go and do this. I've got to drop this off here. I've got to pick up this here. I've got to, you've got a whole list of things that are going through your mind right now. But God wants us to choose the good thing. Instead of worrying about many things, just choose the one thing, the good thing. And that's listening to him. Can we just come right now and just listen to Jesus here this morning? Listen to what he wants to talk to us about. God, speak to us here this morning. Oh, we want to hear your voice. God, that is the most important thing.